What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exist at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment, what I saw these young African Americans doing, was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this Cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up, and to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the Cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes, and I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series, we depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell the story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg.
Good evening. That video continues to be inspiring and even as folks continue to leave us like Harry Belafonte, it's always grateful to know that there was someone like him who was championing the Schomburg Center but also championing black people across the diaspora um, as well as our history. So grateful for the kind of video footage that allows us to archive those moments. So let's give it up for our ancestors and those who are no longer with us. <clears throat> My name is Novella Ford, and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions here at the Schomburg Center. As you saw in the video, the Schomburg is dedicated to the collection, preservation, and interpretation of global black experiences. I have a few dates for you to mark your calendar of remaining programs as we head into the December holiday season. Next week, join us on December 11th at 1 p.m. in our Manuscripts, Archives, and Rare Books reading room for an interactive display and discussion of selected material from the Ossie Davis and Ruby D. papers to celebrate what would have been their 75th wedding anniversary. We have a follow-up program, which is closing our season on December 18th, titled Precious Lover and Beloved, featuring actors Leslie Odom Jr. and Karen Young from the current Broadway revival of Ossie Davis's award-winning play, Pearly Victorious, as they read from their archival collection of letters, many of them love letters. As we know, they were artists and activists and activists and educators, and so it will be a beautiful night to close our, our fall season as well as to celebrate the incredible artistic and um, activism of Ossie Davis and Ruby D. Then on December 14th, we have jazz saxophonist Robbie Coltrane here with his quartet. They will be performing as part of Carnegie Hall citywide. As you all know, he is the son of jazz legend John Coltrane <coughs> and pianist Alice Coltrane. So if you have not RSVP'd, I believe those RSVPs are now closed, but you know, we always take walk-in. And, and if you are registered but know that you can't come, please unregister yourself and give someone else a chance. With that being said, please visit our website at schomburg.org to learn more or to register. Uh, use Eventbrite, uh, schombergcenter.eventbrite.com. I want to thank you for joining us for this closing of the acclaimed exhibition, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration curated by Dr. Nicole R. Fleetwood, who is a professor at James Weldon Johnson, is the James Weldon Johnson Professor of Media, Culture, and Communication at the Stein Art School at New York University. Please give her a round of applause. It has been an eye-opening seven months hosting this exhibition. Nicole Fleetwood. <laughs> It has been an eye-opening seven months hosting this exhibition at the Schomburg Center. Through public programs, activations, and tours, I can personally account for the ways in which this exhibition and interactions with visitors and artists has moved my consciousness into a greater understanding of the interior life of those who are impacted by the carceral system. It has given me greater empathy and a little more fire for the abolition of prisons and new imaginaries for a different world that I hope that we will live in one day. This past Friday, I was at a symposium celebrating the movement changing work of Ella Baker, as well as Barbara Ransby, whose scholarship helped to bring the civil rights organizer and institution builder and critic to the forefront of black radical feminist politics. Now I bring this up because there are many ways in which I've been having these like moments of connectivity. There's lots of Margarets, I will mention a Margaret soon, but this civil rights organizer, institution builder, critic, artist, educator, these are terms that you're gonna hear me say over and over again as I get back to Dr. Fleetwood. <clears throat> but throughout the day at that symposium, there was just so much talk and you could understand better the interconnectedness of liberation work across causes, identities, and geographies. One of the organizers, an organizer and an activist who was there was Miriam Kaba. And she had a collection of zines and one that caught my eye was called Our Girl Tuesday, an unfurling for Dr. Margaret T.G. Burroughs. I am having a Margaret moment. You'll hear more about Margaret's next year. But Dr. Margaret Burroughs is known by many for the founding of the DuSable Museum in Chicago. Dr. Burroughs was also an artist, an educator, and deeply engaged in sharing black history through art making, zine making, and more. Any room could become a setting for learning. What I didn't know, but what I learned from the zine was Burroughs' commitment to education within the prison system. 
the last 35 years of her life was dedicated to art and other kinds of creative work within prisons. prisons. She was influenced by the Attica uprisings, much like the artists who were part of the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition, which archives you could see here at the Schomburg Center, where the, uh, where the folks who were in Attica, part of their manifesto was about wanting to have more programming in prison that would allow them to speak to their humanity, that would give them something to do that was more productive than what was going on in those prisons. And so Dr. Burroughs took that up as her own personal cause in, <clears throat> in Chicago, serving system impacted folks, specifically at Statesville Prison. And as we think about this conversation today, the afterlife of incarceration, I'm thinking about the ways in which Burroughs, like Nicole, like Ella Baker, were these institution builders, were these writers and educators, were folks who were committed to creative and cultural activism, to realizing their political ideas. And so I'm grateful always for this work that you've done, Dr. Fleetwood, because you are in a long lineage of these women, these radical black feminists who continue to hold us in care, who continue to hold us with an ethic and an integrity, and also doing it in fabulous style. And so I will continue to say thank you for this work over and over again. So Dr. Fleetwood is one of three MacArthur Fellows that we have here tonight. Support for tonight's program is provided by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. And so I, I hold it in great esteem that we have these incredible thinkers, these incredible doers, um, and these incredible human beings who are working on behalf of those who are impacted by the carceral system, which we know is not just those who are behind bars, but it could be any one of us, whether or not it's a member of our community um, broadly, or our community, meaning our family or bloodlines or friends. So Dr. Reuben Jonathan Miller is an associate professor in the Crown Family School and research professor at the American Bar Foundation. His first book, Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration is based on 15 years of research and practice with currently and formerly incarcerated men, women, and their families, partners, and friends in Chicago, Detroit, and a number of cities across the United States. He is also joined by Dr. Emily Wang, who is a professor in the Yale School of Medicine and directs the SEICHE Center for Health and Justice. The center is a collaboration between the Yale School of Medicine and the Yale Law School working to stimulate community transformation by identifying the legal policy and practice levers that can improve the health of individuals and communities impacted by mass incarceration. And I will say just one more thing about Dr. Fleetwood. She is a writer, a curator, an art critic, whose interests are contemporary black diasporic art, visual culture, prison abolition, cultural studies, among others. She is also author of Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, which was the winner of the National Book Critics Award in Criticism, the John Hope Franklin publication. Yep, you can snap a little louder, because that's worthy. Thank you. Thank you. The John Hope Franklin Publication Prize of American Studies Association, and many others. She is also a curator, as I mentioned, of this traveling exhibition, which this may be its final stop for now, but I'm sure it will have many, many other lives. This exhibition debuted at MoMA PS1 in 2020 and was listed as one of the most important art moments in 2020 by the New York Times. But we know that this is not just a movement. This is always a movement and always a cause that we should be caring for. Their work overlaps in many ways, and so we will be able to hear more about how their work is overlapping and their approaches to studying the impact of US carceral system. There are many, many people to thank as it relates to this exhibition, so I hope to do more of that when we come to the end of this program. But in case you don't get a chance to hear me, I just want to make mention of this one book that we do have available outside. It's free and it's called Connections 2023, and it's the New York Public Library's free guide for formerly incarcerated people in New York City. It has all kinds of programs that are available throughout New York City for those who are, in, who are formerly incarcerated, ways to help families, ways to help individuals, as well as young people. So if you know someone in your community who might be able to make use of this particular 
um, publication. Please collect a copy of it when you see one outside. With that, I will turn it over to Nicole Fleetwood, Emily Wang, and Ruben Jonathan Miller for the rest of this conversation. So good evening. I wanted to make sure my mic is on. Novella, thank you. Novella is incredible. She's a visionary. She's a curator. She directs public programs here. She's a magic maker. Like, you'll just give her an idea and like, what's happening with that? And then you walk in and we all walked in and we're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Novella is a magic maker. She's a magician. Um, thank you so much and it's been wonderful. Like, it's a true honor to collaborate with the Schoenberg over the past seven months. Um, the Schoenberg Center is perhaps the most significant institution for me in terms of my creative and professional and activist life. Um, it has, it's a home for folks to study the history of black captivity and freedom struggles, and it's also a site to gather for us to plan black futures. Um, I live a few blocks away from here. My first significant fellowship as a young scholar was at the Schoenberg Center. I was a scholar in residence in 2007, 2008. It changed my life. It supported the publication of my first book. Um, my son, who grew up in New York City public schools, spent time here. This place means so much to me and to the folks of Harlem and to anyone I know who's doing research on black art, culture, and history. And I'm so honored to, to just be a part of this long history. I wanna thank Joy Bivens, the director of the Schoenberg Center, um, for just being so generous and gracious with hosting, marking time. Um, Stephen Fullwood, who is the former archivist at the Schoenberg, and he will tell you he was here 19 years. How many months, Stephen? <laughs> Six months. and. Like, he has a whole story of how many months he's, um, but now he's the exhibition coordinator for Marking Time. And our graduate researchers, Miles, Andre, and, and um, Chloe Thorne. I also just want to thank a few other people, um, Amy Rosenblum Martin, who is um, the assistant curator of Marking Time at PS1, Nick Mirzoff, who's my colleague um, in the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication, has really been su very supportive of Marking Time. Um, the Lyceum Agency, which is my speaking agency, and our funders, Mellon Foundation, Art for Justice Fund, the New York Steinhardt School, and the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication. This event tonight, um, as, um, as um, Novella mentioned, was funded by the MacArthur Foundation, and we're so honored that Krista, who's the senior program officer, flew, flew from Chicago to be here to support us. Um, and, but most importantly, I want to thank the, mark, the Marking Time artists and our collaborators. And we've collaborated with so many nonprofit organizations, family members, local activists over um, the course of the many years of working on this project, but especially the three and a half years of, of touring the exhibition. And this is the closing of the national tour. We're not going to be doing such large um, iterations of marking time moving forward, but I want to do want to acknowledge Di Jim Crow, Fury Young is here, Justice Arts Coalition, um, and the AFC's Prison Watch Program, uh, Bonnie Kernis, um, and of course, there's nothing would be possible without artists who are involved in marking time, um, and many of them are here. Um, some of them are currently incarcerated, and so we want to lift up all of the artists who are in marking time who can't be here because of um, the, 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 the bars um, and walls of our current uh, system that holds people in captivity. Um, if you are here and you feel um, called to raise your hand when I say your name, please do so. Um, Cedar Anadkovna, American artist, Mary Enoch Elizabeth Baxter, Sarah Bennett, Krista Bivona, Connor Broderick, Keith Calhoun, and Chandra McCormick, Susan Lee Chan, Daniel McCarthy Clifford, Tamika Cole, Larry Cook, Russell Craig, Helene Flowers, Henry Frank, Gwendolyn Garth, 
Maria Gasper, Dean Gillespie, Ronnie Goodman, Gary Harrell, James Huff, Ashley Hunt, Jesse Crimes, Trey Livingston, Mark Lotney, Ojuri Lutalo, C.A. Massey, George Anthony Morton, Ndume Olutashani, Jesse Osman, Jared Owens, Kenneth Rings, Rowan Renee, Gilberto Rivera, Billy Sell, James Sapesi, Sabo Elise Smith, Todd Hungry Tarselli, Jerome Washington, and Amy Wisman. Thank you deeply. say a couple of minutes of, of uh, say something just for a couple of minutes about how this uh, panel came together. Um, Ruben and Emily and I were in Chicago at the MacArthur's gathering in October and uh, you started talking about our work uh, from very different fields on prison and the afterlives of incarceration and also how we in our communities are impacted by incarceration and we just like didn't want that conversation to end. Right. So we reached out to Krista and asked, can we continue this conversation? And Krista made it possible in a few weeks to like put this together so that we can continue this conversation. Um, it's free flowing. We don't have a structure to what we wanna talk about, but what, we, what we're gonna do right now is begin by having um, Rubens talk a little bit more about his research and then Emily, and then we'll just be in discussion for about 30 to 40 minutes and then open it up for Q and A. Great. Great, great. Well, this is, this is such a pleasure, such an honor uh, to be with friends and, and, to, and to hang out with you all tonight and to view this really powerful, moving, um, you know, uh, beautiful exhibit that really captures all the things. I mean, so, so it captures the, 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 the dynamic lives that people find and make for themselves, even in the midst of the most intolerable conditions. Um, and it captures hope, and it captures creativity and expression uh, of folks. And uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, it's, just, it's just powerful. It's just wonderful to be in your company. You know, to talk a little bit about my own work, I, 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 um, I started off as a volunteer chaplain at the Cook County Jail. This was in 2003. And, and my uh, entree into this work was, was uh, you know, I come from a, a faith tradition. I'm a Christian, and there's a there's a uh, scripture in Matthew 25, and the the most famous parts of the scripture are, you know, when I was hungry, did you feed me? You know, when I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was a foreigner, uh, did you a stranger? Did you did you did you let me in? But there's a part also that says, when I was sick, and when I was in prison, did you visit me? And I realized reading that, you just kind of smacking up against that really important, really central part of the story. And, 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 and in this chapter, this chapter is a, a really powerful chapter because it's, 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 it's the moment of decision making. So if you're in a Pentecostal tradition, you know, uh, some, some, some really uh, charismatic preachers will talk about it as the, the valley of decision. You know, like, 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 like it's the moment of decision. It's, it's, it's when, when the thing that we think is God is, is deciding whether or not this whole enterprise works for you. <laughs> and, and, and you are the nations, so it's, it's not you individually. It's, 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 it's the nations are gathered, sheep and goat. And, and whether or not you cared about people you've learned to ignore and people you've learned to be afraid of is the, is the, is, is, is the ticket for you. It's the, the, the ticket hinges on how you respond to the vulnerable, how you respond to people who are in a weaker position than you might be in, and how you respond, I think, most importantly, to pe people that you've learned to hold in fear and disdain. Mm -hmm. This is the ticket. Mm -hmm. All of human history hinges on this moment. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard it. Mm -hmm. I heard the easy parts. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear when I was sick and in prison. Anyway, so, so, so here I am, a, a, a young convert, <laughs> you know, right? like, like trying to make my way in the world. And, 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 and I heard that scripture. And, 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 I, and, I, and I realized I hadn't been doing much for people who were in prison. I just, I just had not been doing it. And so, and so uh, I, I, 
at that moment decided to try to find a way in, and my way in was to work as a religious volunteer at the Cook County Jail. Now, the Cook County Jail is the largest single site jail facility, at least it was, uh, in the country. Now, there are larger jails and prisons across the country, but, but they're not like in one facility. It's typically across facilities. And so in this one facility, it's about a square mile. Uh, there were about 10,000 prisoners held on any given day. And so I'd, I'd, I'd volunteer, I'd show up, I'd, I'd do you know, work with men, I'd sit with them, I'd l spend time with them. They'd send me off and off uh, to go meet their families. I'd meet their grandmothers, I'd meet their social workers, I'd meet their case managers, I'd try to help them find referrals into community if they had trouble with addictions, for example, something like that. And then I started to see this sea of black faces uh, moving in through and out of that place. In a city that's about a third, I'm from Chicago, in a city that's about a third black, in that moment in time, about 80% of the prisoners were black. Uh, uh, now about 72, 73% of the prisoners in the Cook County Jail are black. And then I also start seeing my neighbors, because I'm black. Now, I was born poor and black after 1973. This is the year that mass incarceration begins in earnest. We're in a moment of uh, multiple 50-year anniversaries, the 50-year anniversary of hip-hop, 50-year anniversary of mass incarceration. And so I'm born in that, in, that, in that moment. I start seeing people from my neighborhood come in. I start seeing family members come in. I started seeing uh, uh, my neighbors come in. I started seeing folks from my church uh, uh, come in. I need to understand it. And so I went to social work school so I could be a better chaplain got interested in questions, larger structural questions that I couldn't answer sort of clinically because the people who I spent time with had known all the same things that I did about religion, about you know, their own personal improvement or something like that. And so I became a sociologist who studied mass incarceration. Well, I'm midway through my studies, uh, my brother got locked up. Now he had been locked up before. I was born poor and black after 1973. This is when mass incarceration begins in earnest. Everybody I knew had been arrested. I had been arrested, uh, but my brother does time in in prison uh, at another brother who gets locked up. So two of my four brothers get locked up. And then midway through my chaplaincy, I meet my father, who had done 20 years in Christ. I just didn't know him. I met him when I was about 26 years old, or 28, rather. And so, and, so, and, so, and so what began as an ethical commitment became deeply personal. And so I started to follow people over time in jails, in prisons, in police station lockup facilities, because I needed to get my head around, what in the world is this thing? This thing that both shaped my life but also shaped the lives of everyone that it touched. And where did it show up? It showed up in the family, it showed up in the, in the unemployment line, it showed up in the welfare office, it showed up in the shelters, it shows up, it shows up in, 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 in all manner of places that are so far outside of jail and prison walls uh, uh, that, 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 that I, think, I think we weren't grasping or we weren't grappling with its, 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 its reach in the literature. So anyway, uh, eventually I write a book about it called Halfway Home. I followed about 250 uh, men, women, uh, a number of uh, families across uh, jails, prisons, police station, lock of facilities, and other institutions uh, in Chicago and Detroit, and a number of cities. I came to New York to follow activists. I spent time in uh, LA. But that was, that, that's, that's been my work. It's really to understand the reach of the carceral state, uh, both within but also far beyond, beyond prison walls. How many laws, you always have this quote about, like. I've heard you say how many laws follow people outside of prison. Yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. What's, no. the, what's this number that you? So this point about fear, <laughs> you know, fear and disdain. I mean, so, so the American Bar Association counted the number of laws, policies, and administrative sanctions to target people with criminal records and only people with criminal records. And the number that they came up with was 48,000. They made sure not to double count. We're at about 44,000 laws, policy, and administrative sanctions that prevent people with criminal records from accessing, you know, the political economy and culture. If you think about just the labor market, that 19,000 labor market restrictions that, 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 that follow people with, with, with criminal records. When we think about housing, there are over 1,000 across the country, housing restrictions. The devil's always in the details. Well over 1,000 in New York State, 1,300 in Illinois, 700 in the state of Michigan, something like eight or 900 in nice liberal Vermont. Right? So, 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 so like this, this kind of politic of fear um, sort of, sort of drives drives our law and policy, which I think is why uh, the, 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 the requirement that, that we see about, that we understand, that we come to know, that we get close to uh, uh, the imprisoned uh, is, 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 a, is a necessary thing. Emily? Can you it's, 
Yeah, it's beautiful to kind of hear how your career has unfolded and wound, and even after having read your book and met you, it's just nice to be in conversation with you. Um, I'm just so grateful to be here with all of you today, and especially to have this invitation to see uh, the exhibit that you've curated. I've wanted to see it since its beginning, and it was like a dream today to be here with my team um, to really kind of uh, see for the first time the artistry uh, and also kind of uh, the art that is absent from our traditional arts, right? It's mm. like that which is behind bars and now is on earth. So um, I'm a primary care provider and a researcher based at Yale. And I'd say my story kind of unfolds, um, and not in this like prophetic moment, I would say it's probably a little bit more practical. Um, starting in uh, residency, one of the kind of key factors that you see uh, in, in medicine um, you had to rotate through all sorts of settings. I was an internal medicine resident at, at the University of California, San Francisco, and I was working in the emergency department. And I remember so clearly um, a patient that had come home, had just been released um, from a correctional uh, facility, one of the largest, and had been diagnosed uh, with uh, diabetes while he was behind bars. Um, and he was diagnosed there, treated there, stayed there for you know 20 plus years, and then released home without any insulin, had never drawn it up. And of course, without insulin, you are automatically sent into a place of kind of shock, was in the emergency department. Then the next patient, two down the row, a person diagnosed with cancer, come home, and again, no chemotherapy arranged. Another person, just released. And again, this time it was just for some stupid thing. They had medications while behind bars, and then was returned home without any uh, resources, and, and then subsequently have to navigate housing, food, and whatnot. And one of the kind of key lessons that I think I never learned anywhere in medical school, and then started to kind of internalize, is that our healthcare system, the way it's designed, and I think it's intentionally designed, is that when individuals are incarcerated, it, ironically, there's a constitutional guarantee to healthcare behind bars, mm -hmm. and it might be crappy care, but there's care. Mm -hmm. And when you return home, to our systems in the community, at UCSF, at Yale where I practice, there isn't a constitutional guarantee to care. And that blew my brains out. I just couldn't believe it, that you move from one healthcare system to another and there isn't the most basic, decent, humane transitions of care. And so quickly I thought, well, this is easy enough. We transition care from hospital systems to hospital systems all the time. Like any of us have been in the hospital before, you're in the hospital, uh, you know, even if you're there for 24 hours, there's a transition of care plan. But in this setting, I thought, this will be easy enough to fix. 15 years later, we have not fixed it. Um, and, uh, but what I would say is that in San Francisco, um, there's a robust community of civil rights leaders that have been formally incarcerated that helped us, helped me see the way of a path forward. And with kind of their leadership, their vision, partnered with them to design a program where we would transition healthcare from the carceral system back into the community. And it starts first and foremost with having a person that's been incarcerated work in the clinical setting alongside physicians like us. Most physicians, like me, don't know anything about the correctional system, don't know how to transition at home. And it takes the leadership of someone who's been incarcerated and who's been successful coming home to then help guide a person through both how you navigate the healthcare system, but also the thousands of laws, the barriers that are stipulated post-release, that long shadow that you write so beautifully about. And so this first program that we started in San Francisco has now, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Shira Shavit in uh, the University of California, San Francisco, has blossomed into now 48 programs across the country led by people with histories of incarceration, really trying to transition healthcare um, and transform kind of the community healthcare system. What is it that we need to be doing in the community? Um, and so where I, where I work now at the SAGE Center is um, trying to think about how it is, what we see in clinical care, now I've taken care of thousands of folks that have come home, uh, how it is that what we see in clinical care can then be uh, answered in research, can then be used to uh, leverage and change kind of the educational uh, work that happens in medical schools across the country, and then ultimately to really try to think about how it is that we change policies, laws, and practices. And so just to give you an example, and I think thinking a little bit about um, kind of what's missing, right? Like, again, there's so much that's captured behind bars. In our work, the missingness is that uh, we know that people that have been released from prison have higher rates of dying from overdose, yeah from heart disease, from cancer, from gun violence. But 
but we have no data, no information about how to fix it. And part of the reason is that none of our national data systems actually capture having been incarcerated in the national systems. Our healthcare infrastructure, research infrastructure doesn't include any information about this. And so we just don't have a lot of data about how to guide us. Like, what do doctors like me? What do community health workers? What do we need to know to help improve our patients? In fact, there isn't a lot of data. And so we've now started a, a, a part, uh, this center is really focused on how it is that we think of solutions uh, that are embedded you know, within communities themselves. How is it that we can figure out what is uh, making people sick and then how do we kind of change uh, what we see in clinic into practice? Can you? Do you want to introduce um, or tell us you came with you came you didn't come alone today? Yeah, our team is here. I don't know if they want to wave. I mean, one of the things I'm most proud of is that there's mine. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's 14 of us here. It's so I've stacked the odds of people that know and <laughs> on a bus from New Haven, right? From New Haven. Yeah. And I, I think unique, and I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is that. Um, we're, we're a center at Yale, both within the School of Medicine and in the Yale Law School. I see Tracy here, too, at the Yale Law School, where we're really focused both on transforming um, both the kind of practice of clinical care, right? So in order to hire a person with a community health worker with a criminal record in the health system, well, the health system's rules have to change, right? Like how hiring has to change. So does Yale's uh, practices for hiring people with histories of incarceration. And so what we've done is built together um, a team of folks that are, uh, uh, you know, our, our center I think is uniquely diverse in that the majority of us have either been incarcerated ourselves or have direct exposure. And so the questions that we ask, the policies we tackle, the work that we see in clinical care, it's urgent, it's intimate, but it's also one that that makes the science that much better. It makes kind of the translation from kind of the center out into our institutions at Yale and then beyond that much quicker. And so I'm just so grateful to be working um, with our team here who's uh, in the audience because it's uh, they that keep me honest, us all honest, about the work that uh, needs to happen. And what I hear both of you saying, and, and please just, you know, mm -hmm. jump in whenever you want, but. I, you know, I started doing this work also because I grew up in a community that was hyper incarcerated and it was seeing my cousins and uncles in and out of prisons. Um, both of you have talked about and written about how your work is about people who are in prison, but about also the health effects and the, the yeah. kind of broader impact on the family system, the neighborhood system. And I, know, I remember when we talked, Emily, you were saying that you're not just looking at the health, health impacts of people who've been incarcerated, but also how those who support and love and live in the house with formerly incarcerated people are also impacted. Yeah. Like, so can you talk just more about yeah. like kind of the broader, when we think about the impact and the afterlives of prison, we're talking about people who've been in prison, but we're also talking about how viral incarceration is, right? It is like a virus in terms of like how it makes other, we all get sick yeah. um, when we're close to such a toxic system. Yeah, and I think Ruben, your book beautifully illustrates this, but what I would say is that earlier on in our career, I mean, I think the literature is quite compelling that if you've been incarcerated um, and then released, there's no question in my mind that having been incarcerated and coming home from a prison or jail makes you sicker. There's no doubt. So across conditions, it's, it's not necessarily, and I think that this is what's counterintuitive, like often you think prisons are making me sick, and this is, this is likely true, but what is certainly true is the return home is so toxic, it's so health harming, that in fact all the conditions, all the chronic conditions that have been studied worsen. And now even more so, what you're alluding to, Nicola, is that there's work that shows that it's not just 10 million plus individuals that have spent time behind bars. But it's also the effect on family members, right? So the partners that stay behind, the children that stay behind, the grandparents. Um, and I think, you know, for me clinically, kind of when I think about it, I've now seen, as, as Ruben was alluding to, we're at our 50th year, so that's three generations of people that have been impacted by the real long effects 
of mass incarceration. And it's not just about you personally being behind bars, but it's about um, the stress of having a loved one inside and what that does to your heart disease, what that does to your risk of cardiovascular disease, what that does to rates of obesity and cancer. But it's also about kind of the mental health outcomes for children, for trauma. grandmothers, the trauma mm -hmm. of having to visit. And, and that, I think, the accounting, the toll of that is, is still yet untold, but it's clear that the, the weight of that that we see in clinic is there, and I think that that's a lot of the research that I'm most interested in is, um, you know, I think too much of our attention is, is uh, we have kind of this whole energy around uh, addressing health equity in this country, right? What are the black-white differences? And to me, I think a lot of what is not explored yet that clearly is how much of the black-white differences that we see are actually attributable to kind of this, the long shadow of mass incarceration. Not just the afterlife, yeah. but also the spillover effects to yeah. families, kids, grandparents. And um, I don't think we have a, a real accounting of its toll as of yet. No, I think that's really powerful. I, I'm thinking about um, the work of a sociologist out of Emory University, Ali Asha Sewell. Um, who finds you know, mental health effects on individuals and communities that are over-policed like worsen after like the third or fourth uh, 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 like arrest kind of in their network. So, so it's like, it's like a, a, a really interesting um, sort of question. So like the, the, the health effects are, 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 are one really important thing. Um, and also th 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 there are all kinds of uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 this, I don't know, I, I wouldn't even call them secondary. I mean, I, I would think about these as primary effects on, on family members in really interesting and important ways. So if we think about, if we think about like physical health effects, it's one thing. We could also think about things like frayed family ties and how that shows up in, in the lives of people in the network. So if we think about uh, the relationship between things like, like, like family dynamics or, or, or family functioning or, or the way the family system operates and something like housing law, for example. So like, what does it mean uh, for uh, public housing law to, uh, or uh, public housing uh, guidelines to be interpreted as uh, anyone with a criminal record who lives in a public housing unit can get everybody in the unit evicted. Mm -hmm. you know, what does that do to the grandmother who's, mm -hmm. the, who's the person on the lease sort of in the unit? And what does that do to the nature of the relationship of the people who are now inside that house? And so on the one hand, there's the grandmother who's gonna let her grandbaby sleep on the couch, that's what grandmothers do, or maybe she won't because she did that before and then he got rearrested and now there's strain in the family system that wasn't really accounted for. But then what does that do to the nature of the relationship between the person who's sleeping on the couch and the grandma? Because she takes this risk, this unaccounted for risk, a risk that, that, that we haven't thought about because we don't think about the role of, for example, liability and how that shows up in the family system. So now the grandmother's letting the grandson sleep on the couch. The grandmother's been threatened by the landlord saying that you'll be evicted if, if you allow people who have, you know, who, if you allow your grandchildren to sleep because we know what your grandchildren are into. The grandmother does it anyway. What does that mean for the nature of their relationship? Now the grandmother's salty with the grandson, especially if the grandson stays out late or, or you know, maybe drinks all the orange juice. Or, you know, like, does any one of these things that, that, that grandkids do? Uh, quite naturally, so there's this kind of antagonism that gets injected into the relationship, and so, and so, and so the, the family form itself starts to change uh, in, uh, uh, because, because folks within that family system have been touched by the criminal justice system. And, and just one more thing on, this, on, 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 on liability law and how this works out. I see this all the time in all kinds of strange places. That's, that's one example from, say, the way a family system operates. Um, but we could think about how nonprofit organizations operate, go outside the family. Uh, you know, can a nonprofit organization, for example, get insurance that it needs uh, if it hires somebody with a certain kind of uh, 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 record? And so, and so, and so like the, the, the routes to upward mobility start to look different because if people help, if well-meaning helpers help people with criminal records, they're on the hook. Uh, for, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the help that they extend to folks. And so, so there's an entire way to think, an entire way to govern uh, that, 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 that just looks different now uh, since we've engaged in this era of mass incarceration. Your, your next book is on violence. So it's, is it a, in some ways a continuation? Can you talk about like its relationship between the work you've been doing with Cook County and this, you know, the, the kind of long ethnographic work? Yeah. Um, and what you're doing around violence? Yeah, one thing that I found following people over time has been 
the antidote to um, all these problems is almost always welcome and hospitality and community. There's like 100 years of criminological research that tells us that access to housing, employment, relationships with people who care about you, all these things have crime-fighting characteristics. Uh, and, 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 they, and they do the opposite. So when you sever family ties, when you, when, you allow, when you keep people unemployed, when you keep people unhoused, it breeds more crime, more violence, like these kinds of things. And so, and so the organizations that I've, I've been following, a number of violence prevention organizations for the last few years, and, and what I see quite often is that the, 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 the folks who are able to help people do things like, for example, put their guns down, are people that create communities for people to participate in. They, they provide them with opportunities and a place to be in the world. And so I'm very interested in, in community as a response to violence, in welcome and embrace, in hospitality. I, I'm thinking a lot about uh, a Catholic social justice teaching, radical hospitality, where, where people open their doors and allow themselves to be vulnerable and take great risk and allow people in. But the literature tells us that when folks do that, 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 that crime rates go down, that violence goes down, that offending goes down. In fact, the, the, when we look at conflict regions across the world, you look at things like child soldiers who've been involved in all man, like in war crimes, for example. The answer is always, in almost every case, that the thing that keeps child soldiers from engaging in violence and crimes of violence kind of thing is when somebody embraces them, gives them a place to be, provides them a, a, a place in the world and values them for who they are. Uh, this, is, this is the answer, and so I'm, 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 I'm now working on uh, 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 a kind of study of violence, but, but, but a study of, 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 of folks who build community in response uh, to problems of violence instead. And is it on a micro level? Um, Emily, yeah, do you want to jump in? You know, in? it's interesting because I think one of the conversations that we are having there is that we are actually testing this. I mean, I think that this very kind of theory uh, empirically um, in New Haven, uh, one of the studies that we've been doing for 10 years, but it's community uh, engaged in its origin, is really trying to think about how it is when you build community or build up the families that are supporting those that are returning home from prisons and jails, how that might reduce exposure to violence. And so I think an example of some of that work um, is that we're right now conducting a, a cluster randomized trial. So in one group, um, and then it goes in waves essentially, uh, by community, individuals who have loved ones who are incarcerated can get a down payment or a, a loan, kind of uh, their first and last month's rent, really, as I should say. And we're trying to see is that by delivering that kind of um, funding resource and having families kind of empowered to have people return home, whether or not that changes community exposure to violence. So essentially that is just trying to think about other mm -hmm. solutions and other mm -hmm. ways of tackling kind of community exposure to violence uh, in partnership with those that are actually experiencing it for themselves. Yeah. I, I appreciate this so much. It, it, seems, it seems like the, these kinds of ideas, like they seem like they're, they're, they're fluffy or something. Yeah. They're, they're not fluffy at all. You know, I, I'm thinking about sitting in a, I, I was sitting in a violence prevention organization in Chicago uh, organization that operates on the west side, and they're working with young brothers who are all shooters. They identify the shooters, they got bodies, they've done things. Some have done time, some haven't done time. Most, e everybody's been identified as kind of a lead person in the network who's, who's the person who caused the most violence. And, and there's a young brother who, who, who has been able to resist the urge to engage in acts of violence, mm -hmm. despite the circumstances he finds himself in for the last couple years. And I ask him, like, yo man, like, 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 like what did this for you? Why, why, aren't, why don't you have a gun anymore? What, your, your neighborhood is no less violent. Why don't you have a gun anymore? You know? And he said, that brother right there, he answers the call at 2 in the morning. I talked to him two days ago when I was going through a situation that I couldn't sort of figure out, this kind of thing. And of course, the organization does stuff to make the communities more safe. They, they engage in what they call non-aggression agreements, so not quite truces, so you can't really quite bridge a truce. Uh, in, in Chicago, the, the sort of gang culture is quite splintered, um, but, but, but they'll, try to, they'll try to engage in a non-aggression dream. If you, if you don't slide over here, we won't, if you don't start anything, we won't start anything, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so they'll, they'll, do, they'll do basic work to make the community a little bit safer. But the, but the thing that the, the guy said that was most important to him was having people who embraced him, people who he could count on when he was in need of something. And he was participating in an art group, by the way. 
They, they, they were like, it was called the makers group. They, they, was, they, were, they were making art together. And, and, and the group was, was, was most important to him. So it's, it's not fluffy, it's, 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 it's an empirically validated yeah. strategy. It's just we don't talk about it as such. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Is there, I want to make sure we have time for questions and I yeah. think we're kind of at the 10 minute mark. Um, do you, is there anything you all want to say before we open it up? Yeah, it's exactly 7.50. Um, so if you have questions, there are mics um, in the middle of the, um, the, the theater and there are two people standing there. So please um, ask. So, um, Gwend Gwendolyn has her hand up. Can you, would you bring the mic to her? I think it's what she's asking. And Gwendolyn is um, in my company. She drove from, did you drive from Cleveland? She said she was going to. <laughs> Gwendolyn, I just want to shout out also, you have an organization in Cleveland where you're addressing many of these same issues called the Kings and Queens, right? Yes. I'm going to stand up. Right. Oh, uh, this is so good. Um, first, I got. <laughs> I'm glad you. I'm excited. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. First, uh, Dr. Miller, um, you brought up about the church. So I just came from a um, Descartes surreal vision thing in California, given by ACLU, about um, not building new jails. Okay, and I found out that they're closing down a lot of institutions around the country. Historically, churches have been um, uh, active in helping in movements such as, and this has to be a movement, yeah. uh, such as um, the uh, civil rights movement, even churches when Harriet Tubman was making her moves, okay, and even in Cleveland, the churches are what helped um, uh, Carl Stokes become the first black mayor of Cleveland. What are the churches doing to help change the policies? I, in that workshop, I've got in the workshop that says follow the money. Mm -hmm. I was really surprised at the budgets of a city budget goes into building jails. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're talking, Dr. Wang, you talked about the health issue, what about if they spend some of that money that they build the jails with and let's do it for the health? Okay, let's spend that money on some health, okay? Uh, and I'm going to do right quick because I'm excited about this, okay? My uh, group, um, once I, I was determined, I did um, two sentences and my crime was drug abuse, okay? which is really a uh, social issue and not really a criminal issue. But one year it was drug abuse and two years later, it became, they changed the law and the same thing I got in trouble for before was now uh, drug possession. Mm -hmm. Okay, which carried a different sentence and a longer time I had to do day for day, okay? But I was determined not to come back, so my giving back is um, I go back inside the prisons on my own terms. Okay, on my own terms. I come out when I want to. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you have to look at the research. Here's some stuff that we don't research. is those who don't come back. I've been home 23 years. Yeah. One thing I know how to do is not to go back. Yes. Okay, so we haven't did that research. We have a lot of people out there that's probably doing it uh, and because of the anonymity of the AA programs and so forth like that, you, you don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. You know, we got a lot of people, and when you're talking about the health issues, and you're so right, I know a, a, a lot of people I know that got sober and so forth, when they came home, they did die of whatever. But I made up my mind, what was important for me was the people who went inside the prison and I held their hands across those lines. And so I think that's really important for those of us who are um, working to tear down this system to go inside the prison. There's a lot of art programs, art is very therapeutic. 
uh, the push that to go inside the prisons, if you got a nonprofit, go inside the prisons and help lead people out. Just like you said, it's about um, knowing that somebody's going to help you. They do give you classes on what to do when you get out, but there's nothing like having a face for that. And I'm going to... Yeah, you know, I, I appreciate your comment so much, Gwendolyn. And two things I would say is, you know, in the same ways that you're asking what are the churches doing, I would ask what are the health systems doing, yeah. right? I mean, I, in, in your story, you've articulated something that I would say having an addiction is not a social problem, it's a health issue, right? And it, that's our job as healthcare providers uh, to state that so and claim that issue is ours and then bring it back into the health system. And I'll be the first to say, is that the health system and the community health system, which is where I practice, isn't doing its job and we could do better. It's not like that's a panacea either. But the, the issue for me is, is that what we have done is ceded power to a carceral system to see that that's your issue and there's, we have no business doing that. And so it needs to come back in, that's the first. And then I would say, is you're asking like right on, spot on the right research questions. The research, and you know, research is kind of a dirty word out there, but really it's, it's excavating what's true. Like what is, what is the reality? Why are people at risk? And oftentimes the questions that we ask in the health sciences and health research are like, these poor people, these, you know, th th these folks that are at risk, what have they done wrong? And in fact, you're turning the question to where we should be asking it. There are so many people that have come home from prison and are kicking ass, thriving, doing well, how can we learn from them? What are the strategies that we can learn? And that's like a whole like frame of understanding research that's asset-based. And so to me, that's a lot of what we need to do is push the system to think about how healthcare systems can take back control, right? And at least like get the carceral system out of this business. And then secondly, asking a new frame of research that's driven by people with histories of incarceration. So I appreciate you. Mm. We have time for one more question, if there's one more question. Okay, we'll take this last one. Um, to the, uh, Dr. Miller, I'm, one of the things that I'm interested in is, I, I've never been in prison, <laughs> but, I, I see, but I think that prisoners, ex-prisoners and ex-soldiers kind of come back to a community, and the community does not want to know what they've been through. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so there's this whole shame factor. Mm. And how, and, and I'm interested in how that shame factor um, um, diffuses its way through the community. Mm. Um, because, I, because I know that I find out long after, the people I've known, and I find out long after they've been in prison, they've never mentioned it. Yeah. yeah okay? Yeah. And, and, and yet it's, a, so it's not only the, the families that are affected, it's the entire community, even though that even though members of that community have never been incarcerated. Yeah. Especially in our community. <laughs> yeah. No, that's such a great question. Thank you for that question. Um, so 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 um, I think that the 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 grim statistics um, are gonna are gonna help us with this problem. So I think you're absolutely right. I think that there's real shame and stigma associated with uh, being system impacted, having been arrested. I think knowing that there are two million people uh, on any, any given year who are locked away, that that's terrible, and then they come home and folks want to sort of move, some, some folks want to move on and forget about that. Um, but the, 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 recent, the most recent literature, or, or recent literature tells us that something like one in two Americans have a loved one who's been locked away now. The, the literature tells us, the Bureau of Justice Statistics counted in, 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 in 2014 the number of people who who are estimated to have a, a criminal record of some kind, and they found that something like a third of U.S. adults mm -hmm. have a criminal have a criminal record. I mean, so there's so many of us um, that, that 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 have criminal records that 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 I think there's there's movement uh, in 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 this area. There's certainly a possibility for movement in this area because so many of us are so are are, are impacted or or impacted through a family member. Uh, uh, in, in, regard, in regard to this problem. And I really do think that um, uh, uh, proximity and, and, and disclosure are two things that eliminate questions and problems of shame. So, so, so when we embrace the fact 
that, yeah, no, it's true that you know, maybe half of uh, black boys will be arrested before they turn the age of 23 in this country. It's also true that about nearly 40%, 38% of white boys will be arrested before they turn the age of 23 in this country. Like, 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 like we, we, we've touched the entire country. One in eight white women has a loved one who's right now sitting in a cage. One in eight white women, right? Like, it, 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 this is not, it, it, it's no longer a problem for the so-called blacks. You know, Trump said, Trump said, Trump said, Trump said, I did criminal justice for the blacks, right? Like, like this is no longer a problem for black people, right? Like, like this is like a, an American problem, a giant American dilemma. And because of that, because we all, we, we now share the burden of this shame. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, 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 so I, think, I think us getting close and forcing uh, a, a, a kind of closeness uh, uh, will we'll go far in, 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 in alleviating that, that, that shame. Thank you for your question. One more, one more. Hi. Um, a very close friend of mine uh, got locked up for a nonviolent crime. Uh, this is a person who ran three, four miles a day, uh, very healthy, and he got put in prison. He got sent somewhere before going to federal prison, and he got fed rice and potatoes just about every day. African American, most of us African Americans suffer from diabetes or have diabetes in our families. And it got so bad, his illness got so bad, his legs swelled up. Finally, the other inmates put him in a wheelchair and rolled him to the guards and said, you need to get this guy to a hospital. And by the time they got him to the hospital, he coded. They brought him back. And um, the amount, first of all, the amount of food, what, what they feed, and I, I'm not saying that if you get locked up, it should be a vacation on Pebble Beach, but people should be able to eat properly, vegetables, uh, things of that nature, and you're feeding these guys potatoes and rice every day. And the other problem was when there was a holiday or a summer day, um, most of the uh, the guards would take vacation. So if there's not enough prison guards to cover, everybody's on lockdown for like four or five days. And all they, they're not getting any exercise, and they're just getting potatoes. So as a result of everything that happened to him, coded twice, they finally, and they found out that he had uh, some type of protein on his heart, type of cancer. They had to release him because they didn't want his death on their hands. Mm -hmm. But now he's still doing dialysis three times a week and uh, neuropathy and all of this, all due to the lack of care that you're given within the prison system. So what's happening there? You know, there, we're not gonna get rid of prisons, uh, but are we gonna do anything to better the conditions that these men and women are put in? You know, um, Thank you for that question. We'll let the panel take that. Do you want to respond sure. quickly? Sure. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I think you're, you're bringing up such important points about kind of the conditions of confinement and how they're deeply health harming. Like it doesn't take a physician, any kind of expert to know that if you're feeding folks junk, then your health worsens. And I, I think like what's illuminating to me after so many years of doing this is that there aren't real standards. Uh, there aren't kind of ways that us as the public can look in at a hospital system, look at the care that's delivered behind bars and know if it's quality or not. There's no public reporting system for the types of food that are available. The public reporting around staffing that's available and that does include, as you're pointing out, correctional staff. Like for folks incarcerated to get food, to get medications, there has to be the level of staffing that's needed, right? Even as we decarcerate, these are critical issues. And to me, it's like we have a huge, giant veil around the carceral systems and the care that we provide, and each of us contribute to this. It's our taxpayer dollars, mm -hmm. right? And so in every damn other setting, like in a hospital setting, community health setting, there is a public national reporting. You can go, you're going to next door New York City Health and Hospital, you'll know what the quality of care is like. You go to Yale New Haven Hospital, you'll know what you're getting. But you have no idea 
the food that's delivered, the healthcare quality behind bars, in spite of the fact that we pay for it. And this is, I think, intentional. This is a fourth tier, fifth tier healthcare system that we've reserved for the poorest, the most disenfranchised. Um, and it's been happening since the beginning of, our, of, of you know, mass incarceration. And I think part of what is, is um, important is to now insist upon you know, new standards of care behind bars. Right now, one of the most exciting things, and I'll keep this short, is that um, there are opportunities now for uh, federal funds for the first time in Medicaid's history um, will cover incarcerated individuals, beneficiaries, mm -hmm. 90 days prior to incarceration in certain states. California is, is the first to approve it. New York is on its way. And I think the important thing is that then provides, um, it ties funding to the, the kind of transparent delivery of, of more uh, uh, kind of uh, transparent delivery of health care uh, where you can at least see what the quality is, is uh, being delivered. And so this is giving me some hope, but you're absolutely right. It's like the story of your friend, and I'm just so sorry to hear about this, is the story of all those that are incarcerated, and it's the story of health systems until we kind of uh, really start trying to force uh, higher levels of care for those that are incarcerated. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Thank you so much for being such an attentive audience. Through this exhibition, we're able to have conversations like this, so please never discount the many ways in which you can come into a conversation about incarceration. We will have time following this conversation for you to have a last look at the exhibition, but I'm sure that there are plenty of thank yous. I'll say a few of them. One, I want to recognize any of the artists who are in this show, who are in this room this evening. I saw Christina. I saw Gwendolyn. Please stand up and give the folks a wave. I saw Mark. I think I saw Sarah, that I think, I know I saw Sarah. There may be some other folks. You know, when Ruben talks about this being an American issue, is that Jared? That's the Sarah. Okay, all right, all the way up there. Okay, I see you. Mark is up there. <laughs> Um, talking about this being an American issue, this exhibition is multiracial. It's cross, it's cross all kinds of demographic information, and so you get to see the kinds of conversations that they're wrestling with um, in the work. I also want to thank all of the artists who joined us for conversations and tours, Gwen, uh, George Anthony Morton, Gwendolyn Garth, Ndume Olutishani, Gilberto Rivera, Sable Ali Smith, Mark Lockney, Craig Russell, Jared Owens. There were plenty of folks who I didn't even know were here who had come here and gave tours on their own. I want to thank the organizations that have supported our public programming, uh, giving us different ways into this conversation, including the Healing Project and musician Samora Pendehues, where we did workshops around uh, writing letters to Keith Lamar, who is currently on death row, and thinking about the various ways in which we can be advocates for those who are incarcerated, whether or not we know them or not. Also, the artists who believe in intersectional healing through storytelling, uh, Lisa, Jesse Peterson, James Scruggs, and collaborators, Zane Gillian, Thaddeus S. Fitzpatrick, Shani Jamila. I also want to thank Stephen Fullwood, who is Marking Time Exhibitions Coordinator, but also a former Schomburger who has been here for so many tours. If you've been on a tour at the Schomburg Center, you probably likely had a tour with Stephen. Um, and as we heard from many of folks today, he's been such an enthusiastic champion of this exhibition, but also just willing to walk around the corner and give a tour at a drop of a hat. So we thank you for that. I also want to thank Michelle Daniel Jones and Elizabeth Angeline Nelson, who are the editors of a book, Who, who Would Believe a Prisoner? The Indiana Women's Carceral Institutions, who really helped us to learn more about the roots of the first prison um, for women in the United States. Um, Calder Zuecki, who is executive director of Art Artistic Noise, which is a Harlem-based nonprofit organization that brings the power of artistic practice to young people who are system involved and others throughout the community. So if you are here in Harlem and looking for that kind of program, it's actually around the corner on Adam Clayton Powell and maybe mm, 129th, 128th Street, but certainly um, look it up. Musician and scholar Kwame Coleman, percussionist Shakur Hakeem, uh, the graduate researchers who have worked on Marking Time, both those past as well as those who are currently and working Eva's on Marking here. Time. Yay. Hi, Ava. Hi, Alice. 
Um, there are many funders who I do believe we have a slide for to thank, but also again, thank you, Nicole, for giving us this platform to have these conversations and wherever marketing time may go, may it continue to be fruitful and robust in the communities in which it finds itself. Thank you all for being such uh, engaged audience and we look forward to seeing you here again soon. Have a good night. <laughs> Wait, you stay for a photo, okay? Stay for a photo. Okay, we're going to do another one.